Hi there, I'm Ken Lammers. This is Commonplace Catholic, and God be with all of y'all. This week, we're going to talk about the 24 churches that make up the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Actually, we're going to talk more about the 23 that make up the Eastern portion. So, let's get to it. Lord Jesus Christ. Ile kroć bowiem sprawujemy pamiątkę ofiary Chrystusa. Weli ni wema na hake to kushukuru daima na popote bwana baba mwema. Tulo onkaradato onzini marimasioni. Okay, when you think of the Catholic Church, if you're from the states or probably most places in the world, uh, you think of what would be called the Western Church or the Latin Church, uh, although we don't use Latin nearly as much as we used to, and uh, that is not the entire church. There are 24 different churches in the Catholic Church, all of which are underneath the Pope, and uh, but you do end up, and they're kind of broken down into the Western Church, which is primarily, if not entirely, what we think of as the Roman Church or the Latin Church, right? Uh, the Western Church or Latin Church. And then there's the Eastern Church, which has 23 different churches. Uh, it's an easy way to break it down. In reality, there are 24 churches that exist unto themselves, right? Uh, each of which have a different type of relationship with the Pope, uh, the Western Church, of course, the Latin Church is pretty much directly underneath, uh, although who knows what's going to go on with this synod, or synodality or something. Uh, but uh, And there are 1.3 billion members of the Western Catholic Church, the Latin Church. The East, the 23 different churches in the East, uh, have 17 million people in them. So I'm going to assume that most people that are watching this have a, a fair grasp on the Western Church. You know, I can go to a Catholic Church here in Virginia, go up to one in Cincinnati when I'm visiting family, or if I'm, you know, traveling out to California, go to one there. It's going to be relatively the same. There'll be differences, of course, but relatively the same. Uh, the Eastern Churches are different. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, really. Uh, now, in the East, there are, they, they usually break them down to each, each church is a church unto itself, but they're usually broken down and characterized by uh, what type of uh, celebratory rites they follow. In other words, how they pray. Uh, and these can be different. They use different prayers you know, dress differently, face differently, do different things, right? Different languages, that sort of thing. And so there are five general forms that you see. One is the Byzantine, and that has 14 churches in it. And that, that form of worship has 14 churches that follow it. And there are 7.3 million people in that. Then there's the East Syriac, and that has two churches that follow it. and has 4.9 million people in it. The West Syriac has three churches with 3.9. The Armenians stand alone. Their church is unto itself and has 760,000. The Alexandrian Rite has three different churches that, that use it, and they have about 425,000. Now, obviously, there's a whole bunch of history and stuff here. I am not going to be able to cover all of that. So what I'm going to do is five. I'm going to go over the top five of these churches, and let me say this. This is exploratory for me as well as you. I didn't know any of these churches really. Well, one of them, I knew Maronites, but I didn't really know any of these churches, and I cannot guarantee you everything I say is going to be absolutely correct. If you know that something I'm saying is wrong, put it in the comments, but I ask that you please put something that will direct me somewhere where I can read the proper you know, information. Uh, and other people here can read the proper information. Yelling at me for my ignorance doesn't help me or anyone else, but telling us how, where we can go 
to alleviate ourselves, alleviate ourselves of this ignorance is, is kind of a blessing. So I ask that you do that if you're going to tell me that I'm wrong on something. And so let's start with church number five, the Armenians. The Armenian church has over 750,000 people in it. It has a patriarch in Cilicia, uh, or patriarch of Cilicia, and they're in Beirut, Lebanon. Um, now, the Armenians, obviously that sounds kind of strange, because the Armenians would, you would think, be in Armenia, but if you understand about the Armenian genocide, you know, that thing which Hitler used to justify his killing of the Jews later, uh, you understand why they are largely in diasporia, right? So diasporia. Um, but let's look at what their mass looks like. <laughs> Okay, so you know you'll see that they're facing the facing the altar, facing God. Uh, turns around to the people and then faces back to God. The uh, I think that m their service is much like what you would remember an old Latin service to be like, uh, where they face God and pray, and they face people when they need to tell them about things, right? Um, but you'll also notice here that unlike a lot of the Eastern churches, there's no barrier there between uh, the altar and the people. You'll see that in several of the others I think I'm going to show you today. But uh, so they're out there. Now, obviously, it's kind of interesting. They wear a little bit more elaborate clothes than we're used to seeing on priests in the West. Uh, but, you know, that gives you a taste of it. Now, the Armenians, uh, I guess, were kind of out there and... When the Crusades came along, they agreed that they fell under the Pope, right? And then in 1439, with the Council of Florence, they were brought in with the other Orthodox. That was kind of the point of the Council of Florence, as I understand it, was to try to bring in uh, the those Catholics that lent, lent towards uh, Orthodoxy, uh, bring them into the Church and, and their you know, patriarchs and that in. Um, but... It wasn't really until uh, 1742 when they were really established in the church and really there was attempts to made to fold them in seriously. And that was under Pope Benedict XIV. So that's kind of the Armenian history. Um, and, you know, I go look. You can find more, I'm sure. I'm absolutely sure you can find a lot more. So let's move on to number four. That's the Melkite Greeks. Uh, they have over 1.5 five million Melkite Greeks. They are under a patriarch in Damascus, Syria. Just for your information, a patriarch heads a church, um, you know, and he answers to the Pope, but he's mostly independent in running a church, right? At least that's my understanding of it. It's not like a patriarch in Orthodoxy where they try to say all of them are equal to the Pope. He doesn't, he, doesn't, he ad admits the Pope's higher, but um, he pretty much runs the church himself. Their headquarters, as I said, in Damascus, Syria, and they follow the Byzantine rite. And let me show you a little bit of their mass. Okay, so you saw there, you know, they have a barrier between the laity and the altar. The priest stands, he's standing in the door with his back towards the door, but he's facing the altar. The other priest is next to him, and the altar boy, although that guy was a little bit old to be an altar boy, uh, is in there as well. They are doing the holy rites and everything in there. So that's where they are. That's a Byzantine rite thing. That's the way they do it. Um, I will also point out to you that notice that they make the sign of the cross opposite of what a uh, Western Catholic does. 
So, for instance, Western Catholic does it. The old saying, and this is a little crude, but it's, you know, spectacles, testicles, watch, wallet. Well, for them, it's spectacles, testicles, wallet, watch, right? No huge difference. You're doing the sign of the cross either way, and you're showing holiness, but the, uh, it is different, and that's how they do it. Um, the Melkite Greeks were, became part of the Catholic Church in 1729, when they, their leader and the leader, their patriarch and the patriarch of the Orthodox Church overall in Constantinople had a falling out over something. You need to, that, there's a lot of historical stuff there you would need to look into, but they had a falling out. And Pope Benedict the Thirteenth brings the Melkite Greeks into the Western, or into uh, the church, the Catholic Church. So that's, you know, at times, though, I think the popes have regretted that because the Melkites have shown a stubborn streak of independence. Uh, for instance, uh, at the uh, First Vatican Council, when papal infallibility was established, the Melkite Greeks held the line on saying, no, no, no. And they left without signing a document agreeing to papal infallibility. Okay, so... The Pope sends people. He uh, sends an envoy out saying, "Look, you got to sign this. You, it's, it, this is the Church's way stance. You got to sign it." And so the Patriarch of the Melkite Church signs it. But what he says, he adds on to it when he agrees papal infallibility, except the rights and privileges of the Eastern Patriarchs. And that was something from the Council of Florence, and he held to it. And apparently, this is very, very much. Uh, upset the Pope. There's some stories which historians tend to think are not true about the Pope really abusing the patriarch after that. But uh, you know, they that is you know they have they are independent, right? They may they're under the Pope, but there is a degree of independence there they're willing to fight for. Since Vatican II, unlike most of us in the Western uh, Church who uh, had to go through a very liberalizing thing, which is still in process and being fought through. Um, they went the other direction. They went more uh, went more uh, Byzantine. They moved away from the Latin influences, the Western influences in their church. Uh, for instance, uh, the one thing I've seen a couple places talking about this: um, the in the Roman in the Western Church, that nobody receives communion until they reach the age of reason. doesn't mean you have to be super intelligent or anything. Generally held to be about the third grade or so, right? Well, in the United States, third grade. Um, but in the Byzantine Church, they, and after Vatican II, they've gone back to this. What they do is when they baptize the child at, you know, as soon as they can after birth, two weeks or so, uh, and you know, to wipe away original sin, they then give him a little tiny communion wafer in there too. He has been both baptized and had his first communion right there. Boom. Uh, so that is a Byzantine rite, the way they do it, and they've gone back to that. They've moved, like, like I say, more back to the Byzantine rite than anything that's been influenced from the West. Um, so again, establishing more of an independent way. So let's talk about the third biggest church. That's the Maronites. Approximately 3.5 million Maronites in the world. They exist under a patriarch in Bakirke, Lebanon, or maybe Bakirk, I don't know. And when I see words that are obviously Arabic in English, I never really know how to pronounce them. But it's in Bakirke, Lebanon. Uh, they follow the West Syriac rite. I'll leave, I see a lot of things saying that, and I see things where you check more closely that say they follow the Antiochene right, um, and I think the Antiochene may be a subset of the West Syriac. I'm not sure. I got a little bit of ignorance here, uh, but uh, that's where they what they do. And let me show you a bit of their man. <laughs> ساب اللحم بدا وقد شوتو وبارخ وقادش 
So that's their mass. You'll notice that the priest is facing the people as he does a consecration of the Eucharist, uh, just like happens in the Western churches nowadays that we've left the Latin mass behind. And But I will say that I've read that that has been, um, that's either in debate in the church or that some of them face the uh, face God, some of them face the people while they're doing this, uh, and it may be, uh, I'm not sure what the status is on that. Uh, all the masses I found online showed them facing the people. So, we'll see. They claim to have been a part of the Catholic Church from the very beginning, right? We've always been Catholic. Uh, but they were isolated in Lebanon, uh, fighting off Muslims, etc., in the until the Crusades, and at the time the Crusaders showed up in about what 1198, 1182, by my former year, 1182, they show up, and the Maronites say, "Yep, yeah, we're it, we're Catholic," and Pope Gregory the Thirteenth says, "Yes, they are." Now there may have been a little bit of theology that had correction that had to take place, but they're in, they, they come in, they're fully in the church, uh, and. They, unlike a lot of like unlike the Melkites, which I just talked about, they do communion at age of reason. So basically, like we do in the West, they somewhere around what would be the third grade in the United States, uh, what eight years of old. So they have first communion. So that's when they do that. Um, their priests can marry and have children, but their monks cannot, and their bishops cannot. So most of, their, most of their bishops come out of the monks, obviously. Uh, and that's a difference I think a lot of the Eastern churches have with the Western church. So that's your Maronites, folks. And uh, like I said before, these were the only ones I really knew of somewhere in my past. And I can't recall exactly. I think in Kentucky, there was a Maronite church somewhere nearby. I never went to it, but maybe it was in Richmond, Virginia. But I knew it existed. So I've known about Maronites. I just didn't know that there were 3.5 million of them in the world. Next we get to the Syro Malabar Church. This is in India. Uh, they are under a major archbishop and located their their headquarters located in Kochi, India, or Kochi, India. I'm not sure of the pronunciation. And they follow the East Syriac rite. And here's a bit of their mass. Nirandaram Mange Studikiwanum Mahatapatuanum Ningal Yogiragate Indundanal Angel Latin Dame Sastavagano Sagalatin Dame Natha Yenakim Okay, so that's their mess, um, and I'm sure there's a little, there was a little bit of cinematic flair being put on there. I mean, the flowing curtains as the priest is standing there praying, and then he turns, you know, they turns and they go, they open up, and wow, it's really beautiful. Uh, it's really cinematic, uh, and I'm, nothing wrong with that really. But this seems to show that. Uh, they apparently have had, particularly in more recent times, I think in the 2020s, an edict saying you will talk to the people when you, you know, face people when you talk to them about stuff. But when you do the holy stuff, you turn around and you face God. And that's what you see happening there. He's turned around. He's going to do, I'm sure, the consecration of the Eucharist and that sort of thing. And you do that facing God, not the people. So this is a church that, there's, there's prior kind of semi-incarnations of this church or, or full-on incarnations of this church, but it kind of got absorbed into the Western church, Latin church. And then in 1887, Pope Leo XIII broke them out. So nope, 
this is a church unto itself. Zero Malabar, it is its own church. Uh, it, you know, the thing you hear about it, say, said about it, is that it's Hindu in culture, uh, Christian in religion, and Eastern in worship. That's a quote from somebody directly. I, I can't find who the quote's from. Although I will tell you, if you're trying to look up the quote, they didn't use Eastern in worship. They used uh, the antonym of Occidental, which apparently we're not allowed to say anymore, despite the fact it means Eastern. Uh, so that's what they are. In 1923, Pope Pius the XI actually set out a hierarchy for them and really established the church strongly. Um, they, again, this is another church that since Vatican II has become more conservative, uh, trying to move out the Western influences and, you know, become more of their own right. So, again, like I say, uh, in 2021, there, it came down from the top, you know, we're going to, when we do the holy parts, we're going to turn and face God. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. They, and uh, so that's where they're at. Now, I've read several things that say they are the biggest of the Eastern churches, but as far as population, I don't think they are. I've never found anything that said that. They may have more diocese and more territory or something like that, but I don't think they are biggest by population. And the biggest by population there is the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. The Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church has a major archbishop on top of it, although they want him to be a patriarch. I think internally they may call him a patriarch, but he's not recognized as a patriarch by the Pope, by Rome. He is a major archbishop. They are located in Kiev, Ukraine, and they follow a Byzantine rite. Okay? So let's look at that. Okay, so you'll notice at this point, there's a priest and six altar boys facing the laity, right? Now, if you'd watch the entire Mass, he comes out, he opens that door that's behind him, and turns around and goes back in, and the altar's back there behind the barrier, and he's back there doing prayers and all that sort of stuff, back behind the barrier with his back to the door. And that's how the prim primarily how the most of the Mass goes. But he does come out to talk to the laity at times, so that's what we—that's what you're seeing there. Uh, and uh, the uh, Ukrainian Greek is when the schism, when the Great Schism came in the 1590s, they stayed with Rome. They didn't go with the Constant with the Patriarch of Constantinople. They stayed with Rome, uh, with you know the, under the Pope, uh, and that has caused them no end of grief over time in history. They, uh, you know, have been suppressed by the Russians back before the Soviet Union, um, where there were, you know, apparently priests killed, churches taken, etc., in, in favor of the Orthodox being pushed in. Um, and, you know, then they, you know, became dominated somewhat, or maybe a lot more than somewhat, by the Polish Catholics, and, uh, you know, between those two, that, you know, they were, they were forged on that, that, uh, that's out of that steel between those two forces, right? And then their real test comes when they, the Soviet Union comes in. And the Soviet Union just outlawed them, straight up. This was basically a kind of a low-scale war between the Pope and whoever's in charge of the Soviet Union in Moscow, and... All the bishops, the bishops went underground, the priests went underground, you know, they, they, by day, he's Joe who works at the foundry, at night and weekends, he's Father Joe, right, that sort of thing. And so the church survived under that. Now, there was a lot of dysphoria, diasporia, never can't say that name right, word right, uh, around the world where Ukrainian Greeks went whoop, out, you know, different parts of the world. There is, my, to my understanding, a bishop of Ukrainian Greek Catholic bishop in Philadelphia. Not sure why Philadelphia. Maybe it was the first place Ukrainians came to in the states. But uh, you know they are they are out amongst the world. But in, uh, they, in the Soviet Union, 
there's a constant conflict where they're surviving underground. The Soviets are trying to stop them. Uh, and you hear stories of people being sent to gulags because they're an underground bishop or an underground priest. And, you know, eventually, though, that's gone, right? It's all, you know, it's all gone. They're back. They're on their own feet in Ukraine. And, you know, up until, I guess, this war broke out, they seem to have been doing okay. They, again, like many of the churches after Vatican II in the East, start moving more towards their Byzantine roots than uh, what comes out of the West and pushing that over over things the way the Western Church does. So that's Ukrainian Greeks, and if you're in Philadelphia, I'm sure you can hunt them up. Uh, so that's pretty much it for this time, folks. I have, uh, like I said, this is an exploration on my part as much as yours, I do not claim any expertise here. This is a lot of searching around the internet to see what I can find about who. And I, if anybody has corrections, like I said, down below and give us a link to where we can go to educate ourselves. It's good to tell somebody who's ignorant how to educate themselves. It's not really useful to tell somebody who's ignorant that they're ignorant. Okay, so having done all, the, all that for this week, uh, let me say the legal requirements I think put on me by Google and YouTube. Please subscribe. Please hit the bell so that you get notification every time I put something up. And please put hit the like button so that the algorithm will say that yes, this is a worthy worthy uh, video. Okay, now that now let me give my legal obligations. I think I'm required by the church. Uh, there is no imprimatur here. I am not approved by anyone from the Pope all the way down to the deacons. You know, nobody out there has said, yeah, Ken knows what he's talking about. So if you really need to find something, go talk to your local priest or your bishop or somebody, right? Now, on the other hand, I must not be doing anything too bad. The doggone, you know, Inquisition hasn't come busting down my door yet either. So I think I'm okay somewhere in the middle. And having said all that, folks... Uh, everybody, go with God, go with peace, and I'll see you next week.